Hello guys, and welcome back to Deadly Gaming, hosted by me, Deadly, aka Scott, aka Deadly Canuck, and all the other monikers that I go by. We are back here in the Egyptian Empire. We have recently completed our first turn, so let's go ahead and click that next turn button. So it processes the turn, processes the turn for the other AIs, it processes the turn for the city-states, which we'll talk about later when we meet one, and the barbarians, which we'll talk about when we have to kill. Alright, so in four turns, we're going to get a scout. This guy is going to get movement penalties. He's going to be... I want him to help defend um, workers when we when we eventually get them because workers are going to be out here improving our resources so we can build these pastures so we can build the mine and uh, they're defenseless so they're going to need a warrior to protect them so I'm going to keep him relatively close by uh, because in four turns I'm going to get a scout that's who I'm going to do my exploring with that being said I am going to utilize this little patch of grassland because I'm going to be able to move quick and I'm just going to give a little peek out here now we've discovered ruins right here. Uh, crossing the river is going to give me a movement penalty. Um, however, it is going to be worth it because the first civilization uh, to explore ruins gets a little bit of a bonus. The bonus can range from anything from finding survivors, and that'll bump this from a 1 to a 2. It can give you uh, gold. It can give you a new technology if you're really lucky. Um, and if you're very, very, very unfortunate, you're going to get some sort of patch of map that's totally useless. It's often over the over over the ocean or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, it can it can give you like the remnants of an old map and and uh, I guess the other thing um, our our unit could improve itself uh, with ancient technology that they find in the ruins. But we'll see we'll see what we get next turn. That's it for this turn. So you know, fifteen minute turn one. Um, probably me talking too much made it about a minute turn two uh my apologies for that we're gonna we're gonna try to move we're gonna try to move quicker um all right so turn three we're going to move into the ruins let's see what we get we have received 80 gold all right and we've met our first person we've got haran al-rashid of arabia um me and haran we, we've got a little bit of a a love-hate relationship He's been my allies in games. Uh, he's been my arch nemesis and others. Uh, he's of the Arabian Empire. He's of the Arabian Empire. So uh, we'll see. He doesn't. It doesn't look like I can see his border from here. Maybe I can. No, no, it doesn't look like I can see his border from here. So we're not too, too close. Um, but typically the first civilization you find can be really close. I've had civilizations, like if this is my capital, I've had civilizations appear like right here, and that that's just, you're going to war. you got to prepare. If you're that close to somebody, you got to prepare in this game that you're going to be going to war. So let's end the turn. We'll talk more about that diplomacy screen that came up a little later when there's more to do with it. Early in the game, not much you can do. Not much you can do. Um, that being said, though, if I go into diplomacy up here, uh, if I do go in, we might be able to, if I go into, so you can declare war, I can uh, demand and intimidate him, we can discuss other players and things like that, or shall we make a joint declaration of friendship or things like that. Uh, I don't think, no, I need writing first in order to do the embassy. So there's, early in the game, not much we can we can talk about and do. So I'm just going to have to say goodbye to, to Huron, and, and we'll we'll talk to him later, most likely. All right, two turns away from our scout. Very exciting, very exciting. We're gonna move our warrior back closer. And as you can see, there's there's times like this in this game where you're not really doing too, too much. There's there's a lot of waiting in this game, but but I find personally, and, th and this, is where, this is where people draw the line is with the, whether they love this game or they hate this game. I find, um, that what comes at the end of the waiting and what comes at the end of the um, the the dull periods like this uh, is worth it. It's just it's such a it's such an invigorating uh, feeling when when you do something successfully in this game. Like when you successfully invade another country after all the planning and things like that. It's it's very it's very rewarding. So as you can see, moving the scout over here, we are right near the coast, right near the coast. So because Thebes isn't a coastal city. It can't build ships, 
So I'm looking at, I'm going to want a coastal city to be uh, my second city, I think. Now, we've discovered a barbarian encampment. So let's talk about this guy, all right? Remember before when I said, well, combat strength we'll get to later? Let's talk about combat strength here. Our barbarian brute up here, our barbarian brute friend. Uh, as you can see, uh, we've got little modifiers on the combat strength because if I were to if I were to attack him, he gets bonuses. He gets a bonus from uh, being fortified. He's in a fortification stance, which means he can't move, um, but he gets a a combat bonus. Um, he also gets a bonus from being on, uh, the forest or the forest or the hill, uh, any rough terrain, like a forest or hill, you get a bonus. If somebody's attacking you across a river, you get a bonus. I don't believe you get a bonus in a marsh. Um, I think if you attack somebody in a marsh, that's just shitty for everybody. Um, so you can see if I were to attack with my scout, it... Uh, projects a major defeat, and as I said before, you know, you know, scouts, scouts, they have, they, they have their big bonus. They're kind of little weaklings. I am going to move a unit because what these, what these encampments do, is, yeah, they've got their one dude that likes to, that likes to hang out here. What these will do is they will every so often spawn a unit, and those units have one goal in mind, and that's to piss you off. And basically what that unit is going to come down and do is he's going to move down through these trees, and if I had a worker here, he'd try to kill the worker, or he'd pillage my little tile improvements and things like that. So I want to prevent this encampment from being able to do that effectively. I'm going to move my warrior right up here. It's going to take him a few turns to get there, but we're going to camp out right there until I get a couple of warriors and we can take out the encampment altogether. So... That's that turn. Well, a couple of turns. One turn now from Thebes becoming a two. And so I'll be able to give you a visualization on what I meant by that. So we're not going to move directly next to this guy because that would leave our scout a little bit vulnerable. I am going to move up here. So we seem to be almost at the edge. This, you know, it may be worth it to, to uh, explore that just to see if we are in the upper corner of a of a continent. Being in the upper corner, I like it. And the reason I like it is because if I have one front, like we know Arabia is going to be down here somewhere. If I'm surrounded by countries and those countries happen to hate me, I've got a lot of places to defend. If I'm up in a corner and this country down here hates me and this country over here hates me, I've only got two fronts. Um, you know, a couple well-placed ships, and you're defending, you're defending behind you, and, and that sort of thing. So, so I like, I like to see, I like having my back up against a wall in this game. <laughs> I certainly do, because the wall, the wall is, is a little bit of a safety net. So we're going to continue marching this guy up, and we're going to continue marching this guy over here to see new territory. Uh, we've got a monument being completed in five turns. Uh, when it gets to that, we'll start talking about this culture bar. So a little bit about what's going been going on in 2013. I guess I'll give you a a little. Well, we'll, we'll talk about mining first. I didn't realize that that was that that was going to happen. Um, all right. So mining. We've gotten mining. Uh, as we discussed, calendar is what we want to go to next. And so if you want. Um, you can always say, okay, well, I need to research pottery, and I'm going to click pottery here. Um, but what I like to do is if I know that I'm going to go 1, 2, then I open up the tree, and I just click calendar, and it'll automatically research the prerequisite uh, prerequisite <laughs> before uh, calendar, and then do calendar itself. So I'm just going to do that and let it automate a little bit for us. We're going to continue moving over here with our scout. We're going to go to next turn. Uh, before I start talking about 2013, I'm going to show you this. Um, because I'm going to camp this guy out a little bit, actually, I'm going to move him up one. So you can see we're sort of at the edge there. Um, I'm going to move this guy. Mountains, you can't 
um, enter. You'll, you'll notice that I've been going around the mountains and things like that. Mountains you can't enter unless... Uh, I don't know if they've added easy. I've only played two games with the Brave New World expansion. I don't know if they added some sort of technology that lets all civilizations do it. I know that the Carthaginians can cross into mountains. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. I think only helicopters... Um, once you, once you're obviously, you know, 3600 BC, we don't really need to worry about helicopters right now, but, uh, I think once helicopters are into the game, they can cross over mountains. All right. So Lord Packle of Maya, we've now met. I'm assuming our scout came across one of his units. So I'm assuming Packle is to the east. Um, the Mayans and me, it's never been good. It's either been, it's either been bad or neutral. Uh, I've never, never had good relationships with the Mayans, uh, or the Aztecs for that matter, as you could probably assume if you knew who Montezuma was. Me and the Aztecs have never gotten along in this game. Um, so indeed it was our scout to the east. So the Mayans are somewhere to the east. Um, so now that I've got this unit right here, uh, it's going to be hard for barbarian units to to go around me and back into my city. I'm actually going to camp them out right here. And so if you open up this little bar, it's going to reveal fortify. Uh, and then if we hover over my unit here, uh, I guess it won't show up, but if, if a barbarian unit were to attack me, now I'd be getting these same bonuses that it's getting. I'd be getting the plus 40% for fortification and, and the terrain modifier because of the hill. Um, and also a bonus for the Barbarian. So it's going to be very hard for a Barbarian unit to take out this unit if it's fortified. My scout, I'm going to continue moving this direction. Uh, we, we, we don't have a very uh, big diversity. You see, happiness resources, um, if I work a silver resource and I work a die resource, those both contribute happiness to my civilization. However, if I had, a lot of times the game's going to start you with two of the same and one different. So if I had two silver, uh, I would actually only get the happiness bonus from one of those silvers. So if I were to build a city over here and get the silver uh, in that city, uh, that would not add to my happiness, um, assuming that I, I already had been working this the silver in the first place uh, which what that does is the excess luxury resources as we'll see later um, they they're available for trade for trade with other civilizations um, and and that that encourages that encourages you to to engage in dialogue with other civilizations because other civilizations are going to have resources like say I don't see gold around me um, so they might be able to uh, trade me gold for my silver. Um, oftentimes, uh, oftentimes you're going to wind up trading your your excess resources uh, for gold per turn, actual physical currency gold, uh, not the actual gold luxury resources. That's confusing. I should have chosen a different luxury resource. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, the the common price seems to be seven. If someone offers you seven gold per turn, that seems to be the AI's favorite number in terms of uh, luxury resources. Sorry, just took a little sip of water. A lot of talking. A lot, lot, lot of talking. This is a, this is an, a, a, a unique experience, a, a novel, novel experience. Um. All right, that's about it for that turn. So let's talk a little bit. I've only got one more turn left on this monument, but 2013. Um, what happened? Well, uh, my relationship kind of fell apart in 2013. Uh, to be blunt, and uh, you know there were warning signs and things like that, and really uh, the reason 2013 uh, was so bad for me um, was because I think subconsciously I saw my relationship falling apart. Uh, so you know I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, um, but yeah, so uh, it was a year to forget. Let's talk about this here. Packle wants me. Want, okay, let, let me process this. Packle wants me to accept an embassy into my capital from him. I suppose because he has writing and I don't. 
uh, he has writing and I don't. Um, I'm not able to uh, accept his embassy or get him to accept an embassy from me. So he is he's offering me one gold per turn, uh, which is over 30 turns. So after 30 turns, that's going to expire, which means over time I'm going to get 30 gold from him. That's the regular price. And if I were to... Uh, if he were to offer me um, just uh, 30 gold straight up, uh, he I think the price for, for embassies that the, that the computer goes uh, goes for is 25. But yeah, um, one gold per turn, it's an embassy. Sure, he'll be able to see where my capital is, but you know later on if I if I do the same deal back, then I'll be able to see where his capital is. And, and I've got my scout in this area anyway, so chances are we're going to run into him or or someone soon anyways. Right now, we're, uh, our scouts ventured, ventured into the range that, uh, I'm probably not going to want to settle in. You don't, like I said before, you don't want to settle too far, uh, from your home city. Um, all right. We're going to build a worker, both our science and our economic advisor, uh, recommends it and they're right in doing so. What the worker does, uh, it's a civilian unit. So, so was the settler. The settler that turned into the city, he's a civilian unit. They have no combat strength whatsoever. The settler's main main uh, utility is it's a one-time use. You get to settle a city. Big surprise, right? The worker improves the resource, uh, improves the tiles. And so the reason we want him is, as you can see, our borders have expanded over silver. Um, over time, the more culture uh, your your city produces, the borders are gradually going to expand and expand and expand. The workable tiles for a city, um, the ones that your little citizen guys can work, are obviously your city, one ring, two ring, and three ring. So three rings outside. Typically, typically though, um, your city only ever really gets to work the first two rings heaven, uh, heavily rather. Uh, however, the the uh, the little f the further ones, the, the third ring is good um, if it's like a luxury resource way at the edge and you just want to you know make sure you get that one luxury resource. that's what the third ring is for. Typically you never utilize the entire third ring though. Um, where was I getting at? Yeah, and so and so the worker is is going to help us is going to help us with that. Uh, all right. So, just going to move a couple more times. We're just going to do a couple more turns, and then I think that's going to be about it for this episode. So that's interesting. We're we're working our way back into a more practical area of the map. Because this is getting to the point where if I were to settle a city way out here, if I didn't have a, an intermittent city or, or something along those lines, it would be very hard for me to defend that city. Because new cities are going to have very weak production rates. As you can see, this encampment has spawned a new barbarian. Uh, we've come across uh, a barbarian roaming down here, which probably came from an encampment in this area. So we may want to be building another warrior soon. Yeah... And uh, and so the first few cities you settle, uh, the spot that I've had my eye on has been up here, actually, right near this barbarian encampment, because getting a hold of extra happiness resources and being able to trade that uh, can pay dividends. Um, down here is also something. Uh, truffles is another uh, unique happy re happiness resource, unique in that um, I don't have it in my territory up until now. Uh, However, that is a little bit far, it involves a jungle, it involves bridges, and so it's going to be hard for reinforcing units to get down there. So I think my first city may be over here, just in terms of a, a safety, a safe approach. Obviously, I'm going to have to deal with the barbarian encampment first, if that's the case. Um, but yeah, that's, I think, it for episode number two. Uh, I'm probably going to post uh, this one on Sunday, you're probably watching this on Sunday. Uh, I think that's it for my recording spree here. I'm just going to put these guys up. Uh, you know, bear with me. I'm new to this. 
uh, it's it's very challenging. It's a lot challenging than you think because you got to be talking the whole time, and you need to have things to talk about. And this is actually uh, these last two episodes are the second time that I recorded them. Uh, the first time, uh, I realized that Fraps wasn't running. Uh, <laughs> I had I had played for a good solid twenty five minutes, and Fraps hadn't been running, so I needed to start completely fresh that time. All right, so. I'll see you guys when I see you.